Hey guys, if you can think about how you found this podcast, maybe it's on Instagram or TikTok, maybe someone shared it with you. I don't run ads for the show or has sponsorships. So the only way this grows is through word of mouth. If this was valuable for you in any way, my only ask is if you could share this with someone who you think would help their investing journey or business. Thanks a lot. And let's get to the episode. Hey everyone, welcome back to STR the Best. I'm here with Zach Edelman from Easy Street Capital. Zach, welcome to the show. Thank you, Michael. Glad to be here. I'm excited to have you here. I, I met Zach at a conference probably two years ago. Um, and I I see you all the time at the various conferences I go to. So it's always nice to see like a familiar face when you go to these things. Uh, we missed you in Nashville, but hopefully next time we'll... Uh, you know, sure. I also year. missed it. I'm pretty still bummed about it, but whatever. Couldn't go. <laughs> Out, there's plenty more where that came from. So fair enough. Or you go to your fair share. So, so Zach, I'm really, um, I'm really excited about this conversation. Zach is a real expert in STR lending, specifically on DSCR loans. So, like non conventional loans. So, if you're someone that's interested in short term rentals, interested in buying, interested in the lending aspect, this will be a really good episode to listen to because Zach has a ton of knowledge. Um, but Zach, why don't we, uh, why don't we start? Why don't you introduce yourself to the audience? So I'm, my name is Zach Edelman. Um, I'm a senior account executive at Easy Street. Um, and I, I would say, specialize and have marketed myself as such um, as a short-term rental lending expert for uh, DSCR loans. Um, so, I mean, either purchases or, you know, refinances specifically or especially post, you know, burrs, um, I do a ton of. I would say seen most, if not every situation in the book. So um, I feel as though I'm qualified to uh, give uh, my advice and knowledge on this subject. <laughs> now, you, you've been doing this for a while. You've been doing this for a while now. So you definitely are highly qualified. You, I'm sure you see a lot of, a lot of applications, seeing a lot of uh, people do good deals, bad deals. So let's jump in there. But let's, let's start with some of the basics, for, you know, just for folks that um, just aren't familiar with this product. Where they're just most they're most familiar with just getting like a second home, you know, conventional loan. Tell us what is a DSCR loan. So DSCR loan is a loan for an investment property that's qualified off of the cash flow of the uh, of the home. So what the DSCR ratio is is gross rental income divided by PITI. So what you're bringing in rental income divided by your monthly mortgage payment, what you're paying out, revenue over expenses. So conceptually, if you were to think about it, a DSR of one would mean you were breaking even because your rental income uh, equates to you know what your your mortgage expense. And the higher the DSCR ratio, the better the terms are, the more likely a lender is willing to lend to you because your investment opportunity is going to, from an underwriting perspective at least, cash flow. Um, okay. And this does not take into account any DTI requirements or look at your tax returns, and you can borrow with an LLC. Okay, so let's unpack that a little bit, right? So PITI for folks is principal, interest, taxes, insurance. So that is, you know, your monthly, you know, quote unquote mortgage payment because you, usually those are escrowed. Um, so that's kind of wrapped it in your one payment, and then DTI is your your debt to income ratio. So, um. You know, these DSCR loans allow you to qualify based on think of it as asset back lending. You're, you're you're they're lending to you based on the actual asset versus you as a borrower. But you know, and I think you you said that you'll lend through an LLC. So you know, most most of the time, you know, lenders won't let you do it through an LLC. You have to do it personally. Um, uh, so kind of another nice feature of of DSCR loans. So so Zach. Um, does the borrower generally, generally have to personally guarantee these loans? Yes, they do. But you can you can share the recourse. So anyone with 25% or more ownership in the borrowing entity needs to be a guarantor. But So theoretically, you could have up to four guarantors on a loan. Got it, got it. And then, okay. So guaranteeing a loan means that if you know something goes wrong and they're unable to make the payments, you can go after all the guarantors of the loan, right? To 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 make whole on the loan. Is that is that the right way to correct, think about it? Correct. Correct. But what what vesting an entity allows you to do is is add another layer of protection. So let's say you vest a mortgage within an entity, 
and we're foreclosing and we foreclose and there's still a uh, remaining principal balance to be gone after, we would have to go after the entity's assets before going after the personal guarantor's assets. So it adds a layer of protection. And then that also, I mean, a lender doesn't want to go through more legal work, but we need <laughs> to because of that. Fair enough. Why do people opt for DSCR loans generally versus a conventional loan? Actually, maybe maybe take a step back. What is a conventional loan? So a conventional loan is an invest is a loan for investment property, but it's qualified based off your DTI ratio, which we just spoke about, which is um, yeah debt to income. So they're going to look at your tax returns and your personal income, um, and it's I believe going to be reported on your personal credit report as well. I mean, the reason why people go conventional is the pricing is typically better, but you can A, only get so many, and B, the underwrite is more rigorous, uh, the paperwork is more strenuous. Not to say that like you shouldn't do it, obviously, but like there's certain, you know, there's pros and cons. Got it. Got it. Yep. Uh, we're going to dig into that. So um, just to kind of summarize that real quick. So conventional loans are underwritten, right? So they're basing it on you as a person, right? To buy a property, whereas it was a DSCR loan is based on the asset. Although the person, you know, that's originating the loan has to actually guarantee it as well. So you talked about pricing, right? So why don't we talk a little bit, just like conceptually, why are DSCR loans generally more expensive than conventional loans? Well, you nailed it on the head in, in describing the discrepancies and which the ways they were underwritten. But a loan that's underwritten based off an asset and looks less at the borrower's qualification is naturally going to be a little bit riskier because a conventional loan, they're looking way more under, you know, under the hood. And by doing so, you know, they are mitigating risk by identifying all these risk factors up front. So, you know, whereas a DSR loan, if we're gonna look less at you, the individual, and look at the asset still though. It's still going to be priced slightly worse only because, you know, there's a lot we're not looking at for you as the individual and thus some risk factors that, you know, we don't consider. So let's talk, let's talk about pricing. So like, you know, I think people, you know, I think you and I know what that means, but you know, when we talk about a price of a loan, so the price of money, right? What does that actually mean? And you know, look, can we break it down between like the the upfront costs versus the the the, the costs of the interest rate or the life of the loan? Because I think people get kind of confused on that. Um, it'd be great if you could just break that down for yeah, us real quick. Yeah, 100%. So there's two main, um, I guess, costs with pricing. So there's the interest rate, like you said, which is the cost to borrow the money. And there's also the um, really the fees or the origination fees. So um, what a lender will charge is, is a fee. You know, It could be anywhere from 1% to 0% to 2% of the loan amount in what's called origination fee. And by doing so, that allows them to hit their desired rate of return. However, a big difference between conventional loans and DSCR loans is that conventional loans do not have origination fees. I think most of the time or all the time. So that dramatically reduces your closing cost. Whereas the DSCR loan, you could see 1%, 2%, 3%, even higher in origination fee. So that would be a percentage of the loan amount, and that would be charged at closing. So there'd be more money coming out of your pocket at closing for fees. So is that different from points that are charged on a loan? Is, is, is are honestly, points on a loan and origin are the same thing? Different names or different things? I mean, from our perspective, they're the same thing. So when we charge, when we call origination fee, it's really just rate buy down. So like a lender is looking to hit a desired rate of return. That can be done through two ways, the interest rate, yield, or points in fee. So, you know, whereas an 8% rate with no points allows them to hit their desired rate of return, they could also do the loan at 7.5 with one point, and that would still allow them to hit their desired rate of return. And that one point is, we call it origination fee, but really what it's serving, like I just said, is, is allows them to hit their desired rate of return with less rate or yield. Got it. So, so let's go a little bit more advanced now, right? So rates, you know, now, you know, where are we today, right? Today, it's February 2024. You know, I call it rates at like, let's say six and a half to seven. Is that fair? Um, a, on DSCR, I would say, honestly, no, probably. Um, I would say on DSCR right now, you're looking at rates from the low sevens to low eights. 
low so seven. Let's, price. Call, let's call it seven flat to eight and a quarter. Okay, so seven to seven to eight, right? I think is is where you know. So yeah. for the difference in pricing, conventional, you're looking at like six and a half to seven. That's kind of what I've been, you know, what I've been hearing. So that, so I think you know, for folks like that's the that's the difference in in pricing. So just slightly advanced, more advanced. Now, rate, when rates at this level, and you know, a lot of people are thinking the Fed is going to cut and there's going to be another refinancing wave. You know, how do lenders think about that refinancing risk, right? Because you hear from lenders like we have to charge you points, we can't go higher in rate because, or at least on the conventional side, we can't go higher in rate because you know, you know, they, they think you're going to refine anyway, so we got to charge you some points up front. Is that something that you know that you see in your world? So honestly. I, I honestly don't see that. Like I know we can do, um, we can go down to zero points. Um, I will say though, in times in which the market has constrained or things have gotten tighter, a lot of our competitors have uh, instilled rules like we are a one point lender, we have to charge one point because the way these DSCR loans work is they are sold on the secondary capital markets. So they are closed and they are sold, and the lender is you know making a premium on. The sale alone. So let's say they're looking to make a 2% premium. So they lend a million dollars, they sell it uh, on the secondary capital markets for a uh, million 20K, they take the million 20K, pocket the 20K, relend, rinse and repeat. Um, however, when the market's moving fast and worsening, you could close a loan and it's a 2% premium when you close. But when you were to sell the loan, it's actually a half a percent or 1% premium. So that yield gets eaten up with market movement. So what lenders will do to mitigate that in tough times or in times when the market's moving very fast is charge points because that is guaranteed uh, compensation or profit yeah. at closing. There's no risk of market movement. You're paying a point, you're paying a point. So that's something that I have seen or we have seen when the market has worsened or moved very fast. Interesting. Okay, that, that, that's good. I think most people will kind of think of you know, are, are curious about why they have to pay points. So I think this sheds some light on that. I want to kind of get off the topic. I think we're a little technical, but I kind of want to back off that a little bit. Um, let's talk a little bit just about your background. Um, you know, we were talking before we came on camera. How long have you been in industry? What were you doing before? Um, you're a senior account executive now, right? So you're very front-facing. You're working with clients to help them originate loans. But that's not how you started, right? So maybe just talk, talk us through a little bit about your personal journey um, in lending and, and in short-term rentals. Absolutely. So I actually started at a different company uh, than Easy Street. And um, what it was, was they had a commercial program. They were just a commercial lender. And they were starting a residential program. Uh, my now boss, uh, my still current boss, was charged with starting that residential program, which was just DSCR. So I was a finance, a real estate finance major at the University of Texas um, in Austin. And I applied to be an analyst, so an underwriter uh, under you know this new residential program, and got accepted, started, and uh, was for about a year. I actually the program eventually my boss took the program, we reached another company, and um, I guess part of his pitch or part of the vision was for me to go into a sales role because at the time that I was an underwriter and analyst, I also very much enjoyed speaking with customers and helping them to get their loans to the finish line. And I transitioned to, I guess, a sales or front-facing role and haven't looked back since. But something that I was telling Michael about before the podcast started and something I really strongly believe is that the best salespeople or sales representatives in real estate started you know, within the nitty-gritty and specifically with lending were underwriters. So by me starting as an underwriter, I feel as though it's allowed me to you know, know ways to restructure a loan and no unique ways to satisfy an underwriting condition to progress the loan. So I think without my underwriting experience, I wouldn't be where I was today. You know, the best people in any industry, I think, know the boring stuff and have, you know, yeah. the technicals down pat. And that's the same thing with this. Like just like in basketball, you know, you gotta, you know, be able to shoot a free throw consistently. Like in lending, you know, you could do the glamorous stuff, but you gotta know and you need ready and know the underwriting guidelines. And I could not agree with you more on that point. And I, I think that's why I, you know, from when we first met, I liked you because I was like, you know, you're not like some of the other salespeople that I've met where, you know, it's a lot of smoke. You know, like you actually had a real understanding of the lending product, which is why, you know, you know, I think we've been able to keep in touch over the last two years. Um, so you definitely are like one of the guys that 
or one of the people um and they know their stuff so which, which is great so but like some people don't know what underwriting is actually so you know underwriting is when it's actually the the person behind the sales that, you know after you apply for a loan it's the person who actually goes through all the documentation and like puts it you know does the calculations and makes sure that your loan your application meets all like the guidelines so usually lenders will have things that they have to satisfy because they're selling the loan to someone else after they close with you so that underwriter has to make sure that they cross their t's and dot all their i's because if they don't do that then they can't sell on the secondary market they're going to get their butts kicked by their bosses because it kind of screws up their business model so you want someone that really understands all that nitty gritty because ultimately if they're fighting for, they're the ones fighting for you after you apply they don't know how to fight for you they don't know all the nuances you're just going to be in a much worse off position did i get that right you nailed it or did i get it. it right you nailed yeah. it and then also too a condition can be qual- can be satisfied in a lot of different ways so i like you want to you know i mean listen going through a loan it's not because the dscr is not terrible but obviously it's not the most fun thing in the world <laughs> so you want to have you know the least painful a process as possible so what i try to prioritize is like okay this condition like what is the most least painful way to resolve this so that my customer is not spending over backwards or halting his own day-to-day life so uh to get this done how many that year of underwriting how many loans did you underwrite ballpark uh i 500 plus like 500 plus. i don't even know okay. I, maybe more honestly um, good good that's a lot yeah. of reps that's uh yeah, you know for sure two a day you know uh, yeah you know. i mean um two, on the phone that's, that's customers t- uh explaining them documents why they're important and stuff um yeah definitely <laughs> earn my uh earn my chops there you go and, and you started 21 right so you're kind of right at the boom Yes. And then last year, you know, let's ask some numbers. Like last year, how many loans did you, uh, or volume, or number of loans did you uh, originate at these? Last years? year, I did just shy of fifty million in total loan volume. Not sure the number of loans, but I mean, definitely, I think mil? like one hundred fifty, probably around. Wow. Okay. Uh, yeah. What was your batting average? You think? You know, out of the ones that, how many? That's a the great line? question. I think pretty solid. I would say like. 85 plus i Dang, really struggle okay. to let alone to let alone die like i if, if i've killed alone i have exhausted every single option in the book and it is truly undoable or at least i'd like to think so okay so uh, <laughs> we can go down a rabbit hole there but 85 percent uh, that that's gonna be it comes to you know product of one your your knowledge of the underwriting process running right? two is could be higher by the way now that you say 85 maybe 92 90 but so a number I feel confident and good in. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. You gotta, you know, you gotta give yourself like a like a good lender. You gotta give yourself a little bit of a uh, little bit of cushion. I respect. Yeah. That. Um, what would be a good um, a good client, right? And you know, it's, I think that's kind of simple. It's like, oh, you know, someone probably just has all their docs together and brings you a good loan, right, or brings you a good property. But is that the right way to think about? It? Like, how do you like say we say I go to you and hey, Zach, I found this great property here, and like, can you underwrite it for me? I did ask you last time, actually. Yeah. You're, you said the uh, the acreage is too big, couldn't uh, qualify me. But um, what makes someone a good client? Like when they come to you, like what 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 should they kind of have already kind of prepared so that you know they can kind of get through a process pretty easily with you? So like you did, I mean, I would say the more details you can disclose up front, the better, even if it's unnecessary. Who the heck cares? People will, will, will come to me and be like, uh, like, I made blank last year. And I'm like, well, it doesn't matter. We don't look at DTI. But still, like, say all the details up front about the deal and, your, and yourself as a borrower that you think are important. So, I mean, just some key points I would say are um, that we look at specifically for short-term rentals are the asset itself. Uh, so send that over and all the details you can provide. And that your experience, the short-term rental uh, operator, I say that because depending on your experience, that actually determines how much of air DNA we can underwrite, which is a whole other, you know, path. What if I say I have 31? Does that what, what does that get me? Well, well, look, so we so we can either so we really prioritize experience. So we can either if if you qualify as an STR professional investor, which means that you either have owned other one uh one other short term rental in the same market as a subject property for 12 months. For any three short-term rentals in the United States for 12 months, we can use 100% of air DNA projections. And if not, we'll use 75. So I always tell people like, 
how many, I always ask how many other SDRs you own. If so, where are they? How long have you owned them, et cetera? Oh, good. I, well, I have, I have six. So that's great. The same market. Perfect. So, you're, you you're a lender a lifetime, uh, your lifetime pro. There you go. There you go. I love it. I love it. 100% Airbnb. So look, I think that's actually a good point too. Um, a lot of DSDR lenders uh, will qualify you on AirDNA. And most of you know, I'm, I'm a pretty big proponent of AirDNA. I've been using it for a long time. Um, so, I, you know, I think fo- for folks out there, like, if people are lending money against AirDNA, I think you have a little bit more confidence uh, that you know, it, it's a high-quality product. Um, but maybe, t- maybe talk about it a little bit, because that's where I, I sometimes have, and I think that I, I kind of have an issue sometimes with um, DSDR lending, because I see AirDNA number on there. Like I'm like, well... That, you know, you think you could do better? Yeah, like I like yeah, but that's great. But like, I can probably, I, I think I can do a lot better than that, or I can do materially better than that. Like, how does that? But also, to someone you know that is starting out, I, you know, you take a twenty five percent haircut, right? You go from hundred to seventy five. But you know, you can make an argument that like even that's might be a little too aggressive. Like, you know, sometimes people don't know what they're doing, right? It, it, there is a lot. A lot of it is based on the quality of of the operator. So maybe just talk a little bit about that. Like how. How do you think about that? So exactly. A lot of it is based off the quality of the operator, and we believe in that. So that's why we do the haircut. Um, and th- that haircut is what we've gotten our, our loan buyers comfortable with. What I will say um, on the air-to-day front is or a couple things. So one, you want to ask, and I'm, gonna, I'm trying to work on a list for this, but different lenders, just because they've used air DNAs, they might have different requirements within that. So I know, for example, there are certain DSR lenders they use AirDNA, but the occupancy has to be above 60% or 80% maybe, or um, the market rate has to be above a B. So like, you want to ask those questions, like, please tell me all of your AirDNA underwriting guidelines. We personally don't have anything related to occupancy or um, market rate. We're just 175 based on experience. But I have heard that story from other borrowers that have actually had loans fall through because of that. Um, secondly, I have heard the tale like, oh, well, I can do better than that, you know, when I pull up an air DNA. Again, since these loans are being sold in the secondary capital markets, you know, we are just looking to make sure that, you know, per our loan buyers, you know, let's say a DS the DSCR is in is anywhere from one to one point two four, the loan will be priced at X. And if it's one point two five plus, it'll be priced as Y. So uh as long as you're meeting, you know a top metric or like the top ESCR metric, it really is irrelevant if you think you can make 80K, but AirDNA only says 60 because the loan terms won't change. When they will change is when you should, you know, I mean, maybe ask about that. But even still, also with all this said, AirDNA giveth and AirDNA DNA taketh, like it's a pretty aggressive way to underwrite a loan. So you know, while you think you, yeah, you think you can earn more, like it's pretty crazy that you're getting a 30-year fixed mortgage qualified based off this projected income from a third party source so you know take with it what you will <laughs> i'm glad you said that because that it is it is actually a very crazy way i guess you know there's just no it's probably the best way i you know i'm kind of just giving it some thought i don't think there's like a really much better way of doing it until unless you really want to just like get under the hood then you might as well just go in the conventional route because yeah, the only thing know, i will say is that like it what, doesn't really take into account like a, let's say you had a property manager. Well, then maybe that could be a whole other story. So like you're a rookie, but you're a property manager. Well, they've un- they've you know operated tons of Airbnbs, or it doesn't look at, at amenities. So that like is something to consider as well. But I do agree that with you know the data that is available, it is the best way. It's the best one, yeah. Um, you know, I think most people are, they they kind of think of when they borrow money from someone. Like I we borrow like I I, I take out a mortgage with Easy Street. I borrow a million dollars for a house, you know, that million dollar loan is like, just sits there on your, you know, what we call balance sheet, right? Where it's just, you guys have the loan and it just kind of sits on your books, but that's not the case. What, what generally happens is the loan is sold. So what does that mean when the loan is sold and who, like who buys these loans? So who buys these, these loans are basically, I guess, aggregators. So what people will do is they will buy these types of loans compile them together with other loans as well that are not the SCR loans and then sell them on the secondary capital markets in tranches for, you know, premiums and then they'll be on the bond market. So those who buy those loans, so we are, you know, we are we have guidelines that we're underwriting that or that we or that we agree with with our buyers uh, who buy them and then 
they uh, securitize them and sell them. Our actual goal is, I think, eventually is to, you know, kind of skip the middleman. So to be able to securitize ourselves and sell on secondary capital markets. But for right now, we sell to buyers that then securitize and sell to the capital markets. Got it. So uh, they, they go to like CLOs and stuff. Is that is that kind of where they go and package it into a CLO yes. and sell something? Okay, got it. CLO for folks is a collateralized loan obligation. It's a very like Wall Street term. It just means something that takes a lot of loans and then chops it up again into different securities. That's all it really means. All these like fancy Wall Street terms. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, the more middlemen you can strip out, the uh, the more money you can yeah, make. Yeah, exactly. But, and, that, and that's why, by the way, like, you know, with any guideline with DSCR is that like, you know, Michael could say, you know, with the ARDNA thing, like, I think I can earn more. Well, great. But our loan buyers have, you know, per our agreement, have to have the loan qualified with 100% or 75% of ARDNA. So, yep. you know, even if you send us all the support that you think you'd be the best operator of all time, <laughs> this is the way it has to be. Doesn't matter. Yeah. No. Agreed. 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 Um, and then, so that, that's great. I think, you know, like I think we've demystified a lot of this stuff here. Um, one thing I think we need to hit on was like the the DSCR ratio. I think we probably should have done that in very early. Um, you know, where gross income divided by PITI, right? Which is again your your kind of your quote unquote mortgage payment uh, equals one. That means you're breaking even. You just talk a little bit about that. Like, what is like what's a DSCR that you know is is good and quote unquote good like that you're you guys are comfortable with and then maybe elaborate a little bit more on like there's certain metrics you need to hit the loan but also just as an investor like where do you kind of want to be so that you know like it, nothing's a straight line up there's gonna be ups and downs that like there's enough cushion there that you know that you as a professional that has done over 500 loans plus the ones of you written and the 50 million you did this year like where would you be like okay yeah hey this is where you kind of want to be, even though I can underwrite you at this or I can lend you at this. I, you probably want to be here to give yourself a little more um, cushion. hundred percent. So our top bucket is 1.25 plus. So gross rental income divided by monthly payment equals 1.25. Something important to note is that we are only taking into account PITI. So, you know, let's say you're paying a property manager that is not taken into account. And that can be a massive, massive reduction in, in revenue. Or let's say something breaks or something like that. I mean, there's a lot of expenses that we are not taking into account. So I think honestly, like a 1.5 or above is probably where, where you should look. I mean, the higher, the better. Something also that I want to point out is that like DSCR is kind of like a feedback loop if you think about it. So the higher the DSCR, the better the terms are. The better the terms are, the higher the, the DSCR. And then vice versa, same sort of thing. The worse DSCR, the worse the terms are. The worse the terms are, the worse the DSCR. So it is really essential that if you were going to do a DSCR loan, I mean, just you obviously want it as high as possible. Got it. But that that concept, I think, is super interesting. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah, look, I, hey, we all want to buy deals that have very high DSCR. Yeah. <laughs> but but <laughs> it's also like literally way, our it, job as investors. <laughs> um, it can make sense when if the lender is underwriting it as a negatively cash flowing deal, but maybe uh, the deal can still make sense. So. Couple actual situations where this can apply is, you know, one for example, like Michael said, you know, he thinks he can make more on a property that's you know, we're qualifying off, off air DNA. So from an under perspective, it's barely cash flowing, or maybe even negatively cash flowing. But he knows that with the rental income he thinks he can bring in, it actually is going to be a home run from a cash flow perspective. And secondly, um, you know, in markets that are pretty expense heavy, specifically with like taxes, so like California or like. Austin, Texas, for example, you could buy a property and be breaking even or actually losing a couple hundred, you know, month to month, but then it appreciates a gargantuan amount. You sell the property and that gain on sale vastly exceeds the losses that you have from the cash flow. But like that is an investment that is a negative DSCR, but can make sense. <laughs> Welcome to the New York condo market. <laughs> we, 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 I live in New York City and Zach just moved here too. That literally is New York City investing. I mean, if you find something that cash flows, you are a very, very rare breed. Every nothing cash flows here. You're always losing money, but you know you're supposed to get appreciation. Um, the fees are very high here, so I mean that's why I, you know, I personally that that was my journey of like out of state investing, and I kind of changing topics a little bit here. Um, you know, living in New York City, there's just nothing that cash flows here. So if you live in a high cost city or state, you can invest out of state. Like it's really it's it's a mental barrier. I think the more than like operationally it's difficult that the technology and 
infrastructure and knowledge is out there, like avail yourself of opportunities to, you know, think differently, right? Whether it's investing out of state or like you don't have to do a conventional loan, you can do a DSCR loan. Um, there are just other things out there that other options that aren't along that kind of like that, that straight and narrow path. Um, I think the more that that folks are um, willing to be creative, I think it really unlocks a lot of opportunities. I guess on that point, like just high level, out of the, out of the uh, clients you have, like how many are out of state investors? I would say honestly a good amount, I would say. Um, we see a lot of people that, um, you know, I would say have one or two in state and then believe it's as though they can replicate it out of state. Mm -hmm. Um, what I also will say is that there's no, there's no like consideration from our, uh, from an underwriting perspective about your location and where the property is located. Um, but we do see a good amount of -of out-of-state investors, obviously also a lot of in-state as well, but any of those out-of-state investors, I would say most of the time they have previous experience. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I mean, it, it takes you know. There, there's yeah. definitely a barrier there, right? Like, um, but it's not, it's, it's not insurmountable. Um, many, many, many people have done it. So, um, again, like, have confidence in yourself. Like, the knowledge is out there. Um, listening to this pod is a is a good start, right? You're kind of getting a good education on the DSCR landscape. So, Zach, like, you see a lot of deal activity. Like, where are some of the, like, where are some good markets right now that people should be thinking about investing in? So, I don't want to, you know. Root to have my investors, uh, of course, of course, okay. Broad, but, um, broad, broadly, yeah, broadly, I think I was telling Michael the west coast of Florida, um, there's a lot of good opportunities. Um, I'm also still seeing deals in the Smokies, like I said, like there's still, I mean, I think there still is, um, opportunity to be had there. Um, so those are, I would say, two uh, solid markets, and then, um yeah, those are probably my, my my two biggest inquiries right now. I'm doing a ton on the west coast of Florida, and then the Smokies. Still, there's there's volume to be had. What what were some hot markets that aren't so hot now? It's kind of reverse that. What were the things that like you know they were like rocking it now? Uh, uh okay. Um, Joshua Tree is is commonly scrutinized in uh I guess lending with regards to values. Palm Springs, I'm pretty sure had like a massive licensing undertaking. So like. You could buy, you could have bought a property like for the sake of Airbnb and probably had the purchase price reflected of that potential, and then now can't Airbnb the property and can't and if you want to sell it, it's worth a lot less. Um, so Palm Springs, um, those haircuts in Palm Springs are scary, actually. Yeah, like, um, all equity, all, I mean, I mean, I mean, frankly, the the lenders impaired there, like all the equity's gone, and I see like 40 percent haircuts there. It's like pretty, it's pretty insane, actually. Hundred percent. Uh, the smoke is with that said, I am seeing deals there, but I also will say we have plenty of uh, loan buyers. Um, thankfully, we have enough loan buyers to mitigate this, but there are loan buyers out there that like, will haircut leverage on deals in the Smokies. So um, just something to be cognizant of. Smokies, Joshua Tree, Palm Springs. I think that's probably it for now with regards to like w- which ones are, are scrutinized uh, from a lending perspective. Interesting. Let's actually um, that we didn't hit on that point. Uh, let's talk about loan to value. Like you know, you can do a conventional second home loan for like ten percent down, right? DSCRs are different. How so? DSCRs most common leverage is going to be purchases start to start at ADL TV. So you're going to put be putting twenty percent down, and then on cash out refinances you're going to get seventy five LTV. So that could be the most that you could pull out and get in, in debt of the property, minus obviously paying off. Your current loan and exp- uh, and closing costs. Got it. Got it. Okay. Okay. Um, and it, it, we talked about this too a little bit, but you know, we, we get you know for experienced investors, a lot of them are sitting on a lot of equity, maybe things that they bought pre-COVID or at the very start of COVID. Things that material, you know, have gone up a lot since the last two three years. You know, they have a loan that's at three percent, and they're sitting on you know call half a million dollars of equity. What options do they have? So it's a tough question. Um, so with a DSCR loan, by the way, you could do it, but any DSCR lender is going to require first and sole lien position. So they are going to pay off that note at you know four percent, and then you will have a new note at low seven to low eights. So you could go that route, but obviously that you'd be losing that low mortgage rate that might never come back around again. Um, so other options are you know, a potential key lock um, where you would get like an equity line and be able to extract um, that equity. Typically, those are rates though that are like 10 plus income of points. Um, 
And I'm also pretty sure you can't vest that with an LLC. So there are some limitations to consider. Yeah. So that would probably be the best option. With that said, we don't offer them. And um, I'm not sure who does. But like, if you want to pull out equity and there's um, and you have a current mortgage that has a great rate, HELOC's probably your best bet. I don't know of any really second lenders that are doing second position mortgages on residential investment properties and are qualifying them, I guess, with the SCR. I don't really know any, to be honest with you guys, right now. So um, it's certainly a lot harder of a thing to find, but yet something that certainly has a lot of demand. So hopefully yeah. someone figures it out. <laughs> well, if you're a smart capital markets person listening to this, then uh, if you can unlock that puzzle piece, and there's definitely a lot of demand out there for that. So, um, and it just for folks that aren't as familiar with these terms. So, second position just means that we have a mortgage that lenders in first position. So, they have like the first bite at the apple if something goes wrong. And then the second lean position, second position has to kind of wait for that first person to be done. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, they kind of get the leftover. So, it's a much more difficult position to be in because if you're not lender on the second loan on the second position, if something went wrong, like you know, you generally don't want to be have to wait for someone else to be done first before you get your butt at the apple because uh, the asset will probably be fairly impaired. Um, so that's why it's kind of hard. But I think a lot of people are sitting on a lot of equity and, and really want to try to figure out a way to unlock that. You know, there's a, there's a lot of talk on social media and just in general about like you know return on equity or your efficiency on your equity. It's great to have the loan there, but also if you don't want to sell. Um, you know, you are like, it, it, it's actually your return on equity is probably pretty crappy actually, right? Because you're making a good return, but if you can't unlock the equity, it's just kind of sitting there. Um, 100%. it might be like, you know, maybe you're, maybe, you, you know, you came with 20% now you have like 40 or 50% equity versus a loan, right? Like that's not a fantastic, it's great for the lender. <laughs> it's very, it's great for that first position lender, but not super great for, uh, the equity holders. Yeah. And also, I mean, just something to realize like, I mean, it can still sell them way, but if you're pulling out equity for another opportunity and that opportunity, you know, rate of return exceeds, you know, the current interest rate that you have, or, you know, you can, there's, there's math associated with this that like, it can make sense to pull out that equity, you know, have a higher interest rate, but with this new opportunity, it can still make sense. So, you for know, sure. obviously it's a scary thing to do, but in front of your numbers, <laughs> but like it can make sense. Leverage on leverage. Have you heard that Munger, uh, the the Charlie Munger saying about how um, there's a Charlie Munger uh, who recently passed away. who's was Warren Buffett's kind of second at Berkshire Hathaway, and then he, he had a quote. It's a really funny one. I remember it's like, uh, "Smart men go broke three ways: liquor, ladies, leverage." <laughs> I've not heard that, but that is unreal. <laughs> and, like you know, not not untrue. There's some some pretty good. Uh, it's it you know it's, it's, a, it's a funny quote. But hey, Zach, uh, you know, really appreciate you you spending time with me today. Um, you know, and just sharing your knowledge, your 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 really deep knowledge in the space. Final question: You know, business is a team sport. Um, wouldn't be where we are today without you know people that kind of helped us along the way. You know. Who's someone that's really kind of helped you along in your journey? You're you're young, you got a long way to go. Who's someone that's really kind of helped you get to where you are today? Easy answer for me, without a doubt, is my uh I guess not my head of sales, but like the head of the program, Robin. Um Robin Simon. He has uh put me in places to succeed and believed in me, you know, so spent money for me to go to conferences and stuff, believed in my potential. And I feel like trust him with a lot of, you know, ideas and tasks that someone at my age with my experience you know, wouldn't be trusted with elsewhere. So definitely Robin, if you're listening to this, uh, thank you. Well, shout out to Robin. I've met Robin for a great guy. Uh, and folks, you know, if you're looking for a great lender, and I just recommend, you know, talk to someone that really knows what they're doing. Like if you listen to earlier part of this, make sure, you know, really ask questions, right? I think I always ask, do you own STRs, right? Do you, have you done the underwriting before? How long have you done this? Um, you know, how many loans did you originate last year? Just ask the questions. It's like, don't get um, caught up in the, you know, song and dance. Like, you know, I like think a lot of people, they, they kind of can talk a big game, but unlike Zach here, it's been doing this for a long time. Really understand the nuts and bolts uh, of the industry. I'm trying to come out with a list of like best questions to ask your DSTR lender for SDRs. So hopefully I can uh, release that soon. That'll be helpful as well. It's like a checklist. Yeah, I put it on your social media. Um, uh, Zach, where's uh? How, how do folks find you? So you can find me at my Instagram at Zach Z A C H Edelman E D E L M A N E S C, 
um, or my Facebook, it's uh, just Zach Edelman, um, or uh, on Bigger Pockets or LinkedIn. And then also, if you want to hit me up directly, feel free to email me at zach at usedbecap.com. Okay. Hey, so, so I'm going to put Zach's uh, Instagram because uh, I believe very much in help you know in helping people, smart people build their social media. So give uh, check out Zach on on his Instagram account. Give him a follow. Send him a DM. Uh, and uh, you know Zach, I excited to uh, continue working together. Hopefully, we can find something to work on uh, in the near future. And uh, thanks again for spending time with uh, with me today and sharing your knowledge. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. This is awesome. 